At the end of the last section of this lecture, I was talking about the major problems of macroeconomic instability and external uh, imbalance and crisis, which affected uh, many, most countries in Latin America in the 1970s and 1980s. Those features, uh, external instability, uh, domestic macroeconomic stability, in fact, can be thought of as characterizing a large part of Latin American economic history. This is a quote from uh, the Chilean uh, economist, again, Sebastian Edwards, saying that over the years, large devaluations, uh, debt moratoria, and runaway inflation seem to be the norm rather than the exception in Latin America. This is a, a, a graph of data um, taken from um, Reinhardt and Rogoff's book, This Time It's Different, that shows the, the share of the years uh, in default or that various countries in Latin America have been in default or, uh, or where they've been under rescheduling of foreign debt arrangements since 1800 or since uh, uh, independence. And you can see that um, only uh, Uruguay uh, has uh, spent less than 20% of its time um, in uh, default, uh, external default or under external rescheduling um, arrangements. And that uh, uh, many countries are, are more up around the 30 to 40 percent um, amount. So yeah, that would include, for example, um, Argentina uh, and uh, Colombia and uh, other um, countries there as well. So uh, when we talk about the period of the 1980s and the external crises, uh, that's been a, a not uncommon um, aspect of um, economic performance in Latin um, America. Similarly, um, high inflation um, has been um, nothing um, new. So um, this graph, um, again from Reinhardt and Rogoff, shows the, the share of uh, uh, years, uh, again since independence or 1800, in which the inflation rate exceeded uh, in the blue line either 20% or the red line um, over um, 40%. And so if we take Uruguay as our case again, we can see that in 25% of the years um, that Uruguay is included in this data set, uh, inflation has exceeded 20%. And in almost 20% of the years, inflation's exceeded, uh, exceeded 40%. Uh, percent. Um, if we look at Brazil, we can see over 25% of years the inflation rates exceeded 20%, um, and around about uh, 15 to 20%, it's exceeded um, 40%. Uh, percent. So, so countries in Latin America, the experience of uh, macroeconomic instability through um, high inflation, the experience of external debt crises have been uh, common features um, of the, uh, of the um, experience. And so uh, in the aftermath of the 1980s um, uh, crisis, um, policymakers um, international, in, at international agencies uh, who uh, looked at Latin America uh, thought that um, the, the recipe um, for getting away from uh, these long-term problems um, of uh, external crises, long-term problems of inflation was, was really to uh, implement a large-scale uh, change in um, institutional arrangements in, in policy. And, and while uh, this set of policies was never exactly codified by the international policy uh, making agencies, it, it came to be referred to as the Washington, um, the Washington Consensus. Um, and as I'll describe in, in, in a moment, a lot of countries in, in Latin America um, in the period from the 19, uh, late 1980s, 1990s onwards uh, came to implement um, various features um, of um, the, the, the Washington um, consensus. As I talked about in the last section of the lecture, the, the, the idea that there might be problems with ISI type policies had, had really been around uh, or had been evident um, since the um, 1960s. Uh, but it was really only the episodes of major crisis in the 1980s um, that uh, provides a basis for um, 
uh, attempts to make significant reform to that uh, policy approach. And primarily that seems to be explained by political economy, that there were um, urban industrial consistencies who, constituencies who were gaining um, from ISI policies and they were very keen for those policies to continue. It was, it was only when there was a real um, economic crisis um, that um, the basis was provided for um, major um, policy reform. This policy approach known as the Washington Consensus I guess can be thought of as having three key elements the idea that you, you need macroeconomic stabilisation as a basis for um, strong economic growth, the idea that uh, you need the public sector uh, to play a role promoting economic growth rather than uh, uh, stymieing or acting as a drag on economic growth, and, and thirdly the idea that you really need to uh, open up the economy to uh, international uh, trade to gain uh, the direct uh, benefits from uh, being able to trade but also because of the, the spillover effects on, for example, um, efficiency in the local economy that opening up to international trade um, provides. Um, John Williamson, uh, who is the uh, person uh, in um, uh, 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 often or uh, very extensively cited article who provided the characterization of the Washington Consensus, he, he laid out um, the Washington Consensus in a little bit more detail. He said that this approach to policy making that um, policy makers, primarily the international agencies, the World Bank and the IMF, were, were pushing to be implemented in areas like Latin America. What it involved was first of all fiscal balance, um, secondly uh, targeting social expenditure by government at the less well off. So, so provision of um, government subsidies and assistance should really be restricted to providing a, a social safety net um, to the less well off in the population rather than distorting economic activity uh, in, in, in various ways. That there should be tax reform um, to promote, uh, uh, provide incentives um, for and promote economic activity. That there should be um, deregulation of the um, uh, finance sector motivated by the idea that financial development um, has often historically been an important engine for um, economic development. Uh, that there should be encouragement of foreign direct investment. Um, that um, where government um, was a major player in the economy through state-owned enterprises uh, and especially where those state-owned enterprises were perceived to be performing inefficiently, that they should be privatised. Uh, that uh, a profit motive should be um, injected into those organisations to try and improve the efficiency of their um, performance. Um, that there should be a reduction of regulation of business and that where there weren't secure property rights, um, there should be improved protection of um, property um, rights. So that was um, how Williamson characterised the reform approach uh, to uh, changing economic policy, changing economic institutions in um, Latin America um, based on advice from um, Washington policymakers um, at the time. Um, this approach to policy making can be thought of as being um, to at least some degree having been implemented in um, most of the countries in um, Latin America, although as I've noted here on, on the slide, the exact timing and scale certainly differ uh, by um, country. Now um, coming out of the periods of crisis in the early uh, 1980s and having sort of very high inflation in the mid um, 1990s, the implementation of these policies, uh, the, the Washington Consensus type policies in the 1980s and, and 1990s, seem to uh, be uh, benefiting um, the Latin American um, economies. And so, um, as this quote from Edwards um, says, in, by 1994 there was heightened hope for um, Latin um, um, America. Um, however, it turns out that this was to be uh, another a really false start for Latin uh, uh, America and there would be um, issues about institutions and policies in Latin America that would uh, plunge much of the region um, further into crisis again 
um, in the 1990s and 2000s and lead to the, the relatively um, anemic um, rates of growth in GDP per capita um, that um, I showed in the first part of uh, this uh, lecture. And, and uh, one um, perhaps mainstream um, characterization amongst um, economists about why this happened has, has been the, the limits um, that there were um, on the reform that took place. Um, in particular, um, the, the limits on domestic market reform that occurred, and in particular the fact that um, some Latin American um, countries um, adopted exchange rates that were pegged against uh, the United States uh, during this period, which became a, a major source of, uh, mac of external and internal uh, macroeconomic um, in instability. Um, building on that, um, second point I mentioned about um, the exchange rates, Latin America, it turned out, had a really uh, a dangerous um, a combination um, or, or particular countries in Latin America uh, had a, a dangerous combination um, in the uh, early um, to, to late um, 1990s. That combination was a uh, uh, a pegged or fixed exchange rate, and, and in particular, an environment where um, some countries had uh, exchange rates that were overvalued, um, that made it more expensive to buy their exports and, and made it uh, cheaper um, to buy their imports, which gave rise to uh, large external uh, uh, deficits. Um, and you know, notwithstanding the the, the problems that had occurred in the 1970s and 1980s, often holding those debts um, in uh, denominated in foreign uh, in foreign um, currency. Um, now, so so here you've got a situation where you've got a large external uh, deficit because imports are exceeding uh, uh, exports. Um, you you. Uh, have got a fixed exchange rate so that the exchange rate's not adjusting to uh, do anything to um, undo that imbalance by changing the relative prices of your exports um, and imports. So you really need some other way of, of making your um, exports um, cheaper so that they're more likely to be bought by the rest of the world and making the goods that you're producing to compete against imports cheaper so they become more competitive against um, imports. But another major problem in Latin America in the 1990s, and this is where the point about um, limits to domestic market reform partly comes in, um, a lot of countries in Latin America, especially countries that were subject to these first three factors, uh, had um, relatively low levels of labour market um, flexibility. So there was relatively little scope um, for there to be an adjustment through the labour market to um, the external deficit situation, say um, falls in um, labour costs that would bring down the price of exports, bring down the price of locally produced goods that are competing against um, imports. There was an, an absence of labour market flexibility that prevented, um, that, prevented that from um, happening. And, and James Mead, um, Nobel Prize winning economist, I guess has what's sometimes called Mead's dictum, which is the idea that uh, if you have a situation of external deficit, then you really need to have either the capacity to devalue your exchange rate, which couldn't happen here while there was fixed exchange rates, or you need um, flexible labour market institutions so that you can reduce uh, so that you can reduce the cost of um, the cost of production. Um, the other problem, as we'll see, which um, some countries in Latin America had at this time, was that they, they had engaged in substantial financial market um, deregulation, and in particular reducing um, barriers to international capital flows. Uh, and so there was a capacity for um, large short-term capital flows to go in and out of um, these countries in a way that had the potential to, to really destabilise um, those um, countries. So this dangerous combination existed in, in a variety of Latin American countries in the 1990s, um, 2000, early 2000s, 
and, and it gave rise to further episodes of uh, external crisis, as I'll talk about now, for two countries, Mexico and Argentina. Um, so in Mexico in early 1994, there's, there's political instability, um, some um, political assassinations, attacks by rebel groups on the government that, that, that um, worries international investors and causes capital outflow um, from uh, Mexico. To try and um, restore um, external balance, the Mexican government um, introduces or, or um, issues um, uh, new bonds um, denominated in US dollars. Um, and there's also a line of credit um, extended to uh, Mexico um, by uh, the, the US. Um, that issuing of bonds um, has a short-term stabilizing um, uh, effect on Mexico's external situation. But um, by later that year, several factors um, cause um, accelerating capital inflow. Um, for example, a lack of transparency about Mexico's um, level of international reserves causes international investors, investors to be very worried about whether Mexico might be about to default on external de debts and causes um, large amounts of um, capital um, capital um, outflow. Um, Mexico, which has had, as I described on the, the last slide about the combination of factors, Mexico, which has had uh, a, a pegged exchange rate, um, is, is then forced to introduce um, the scope to devalue um, its currency by 15%. Essentially, at this period, Mexico's currency was, was um, pegged, but within a band. There was a band that it could move between. Um, and, and so what the government did is they reduced the lower band by 15% to allow the scope to devalue uh, by 15%. Uh, that doesn't do much to restore confidence in the situation in Mexico's economy because international investors are expecting that uh, there should be um, some other reforms to the economy announced that are going to deal with the, the, the structural issue of um, external um, deficit, but that doesn't happen. And so then there's really another phase of acceleration in um, capital inflow, and eventually the government's forced to uh, allow um, flexible uh, exchange rates, but which of course um, increases greatly the cost of um, paying back um, the US denominated um, bonds, which have been issued um, as um, a uh, a method of trying to um, impart um, stability to the economy during that crisis of um, 1994. So major um, disruption um, to the Mexican economy from trying to uh, have a system of flexible, uh, uh, sorry, have a system of pegged exchange rates. Um, to do that in a situation where there was external deficit, to do that in an environment where there was a capacity for um, international investors to be rapidly withdrawing um, their currency from the economy. And in particular, so, and in, in the end, Mexico is forced to uh, devalue significantly and allow uh, uh, flexible um, exchange rates. In Argentina, uh, a major episode of external crisis occurs um, in the early 2000s. This begins with a, a, a weak Argentinian economy in the late 1990s, early 2000s. Um, it, it, it has an overvalued exchange rate. Um, there are reduced capital inflows to Argentina in the aftermath of the financial crisis. That, that causes a major economic downturn um, in um, Argentina. In 2001, against the, the background of uh, the weakened economy, Argentina uh, changes um, or announces a change to its method of, of pegging the exchange rate. Uh, and this leads to a belief, even though this isn't actually what's announced, this leads to a belief amongst international investors um, that uh, there is going to be uh, a, a shift to a flexible exchange rate in Argentina, which would lead to a, a significant um, depreciation um, of um, the Argentine um, currency. Uh, that causes uh, massive capital outflow by speculators who are speculating against the possibility of, of, of removing their, their currency from Argentina now and putting it back in when 
um, they can buy back Argentine currency at um, a much lower uh, uh, exchange rate or a much better um, exchange, um, much better exchange rate. Uh, there, as in Mexico, um, there, there's, there's an issue about um, the credibility of policy reforms which the Argentine government put in place to try and address the, the structural issue of the external deficit um, that's uh, uh, developed. And continued capital outflow means that um, Argentina defaults on its external debt at the end of December um, 2001. Um, the uh, exchange rate is initially um, devalued in January 2002 and then there's a shift to a flexible exchange rate in February and by mid-April the exchange rate's gone from one peso um, per US dollar to four pesos per US dollar. So basically a, um, a reduction by a factor of four in the value of the, um, of the peso. Um, and um, as in, in Mexico where there'd also been this large um, depreciation of the currency when um, shift to a flexible currency occurs, there are massively large social costs of adjustment um, from the depreciation in the value of the currency. Um, what that implies for um, uh, affordability um, of uh, uh, imports, um, what that implies for a restructuring of um, economic activity um, within um, the, the, the country. And so yeah, in Argentina there's uh, large reductions in real wages, unemployment um, reaches um, 20%. Um, so uh, despite um, the implementation of the Washington consensus uh, reforms, still issues about the policy settings in countries like Mexico and Argentina, which mean that the 1990s and 2000s uh, are continued periods of uh, macroeconomic uh, instability and, and, and as a result slow economic growth. This graph shows GDP per capita in Mexico and Argentina from 1990 through to 2010. Uh, for Mexico you can see the effect of the 1990 crisis in the decline in GDP per capita um, that takes place there. You can see in Argentina the weakening economy from the late um, 1990s um, uh, and then the sort of accelerated decline in um, GDP per capita when you also have the external default and the um, depreci depreciation. So uh, following that you recovery in Argentina but if you look at the whole period from 1990 through to 2010 um, uh, st still relatively slow growth and especially in Mexico relatively slow growth over the um, whole of um, that uh, period. So, so what can we take um, from um, this? Uh, what I think a majority of economic commentators have taken from it is uh, that um, the Washington consensus reforms um, certainly um, can't be considered to uh, have uh, been um, a, a, a major um, success in, um, to the extent that they were implemented in, in Latin um, uh, America. And, and, and one uh, point that's arisen there is, is the idea that uh, the job of doing reform policy institutional reform in Latin America is, is highly um, complex. And, and that really brings us back to the second part of the lecture where I talked about the colonial origins of institutions and policy approaches in, in Latin um, uh, America. That in Latin America you, you're talking about uh, uh, deep-rooted um, systems of um, institutions. Um, you, you're talking about ex extensive um, systems of um, institutions and policies that would need um, reform to shift Latin America, uh, the quality of institutions and policies in Latin America from uh, where they'd been in the 1980s to being comparable uh, to, to developed um, uh, economies. And, and so uh, one point that I think emerges from this period is the idea that there's, there's no quick fixes for a region like um, Latin, uh, Latin America. Uh, that uh, policy reform, institutional reform in Latin America really has to 
um, address the deep-rooted um, sources of uh, institutions in Latin America, and also really has to address a wide variety of uh, policies that affect um, economic um, performance. And, and unless that's done, if you only get uh, partial reform, as, as happened in many of the Latin American um, economies, then you're unlikely to get sustained economic growth. In fact, what you may set up are uh, uh, inconsistencies that in fact uh, can sometimes be the source of greater macroeconomic instability. So for example, the idea of deregulating financial markets without deregulating labour markets, that that uh, means that you can get uh, very large movements of capital flows into and out of uh, a country that put uh, a huge degree of pressure on uh, on exchange rates, on international reserves that create the possibility of external default, but 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 you don't uh, introduce the possibility of uh, trying to respond to what the external situation is through um, flexibility in the um, in the cost of um, production. Um, so uh, a, a major issue in thinking about uh, the future of economic development in Latin America and, and thinking about this period of the 1990s and 2000s has been the idea of, of whether there's a need for more um, thoroughgoing um, reform. And, and, and there, uh, those who want to argue for more thoroughgoing reform have, have often su suggested Chile as, as a case study um, in um, success. So under the uh, Allende government from 1970 to 1973, Chile had really moved towards uh, a very socialist um, uh, system of um, policy for um, economic um, development. With the military overthrow of the Allende government and the military, General Pinochet, uh, coming to power, they really started in Chile uh, a, a, a series of stages of economic reform which have um, undone um, the, the, the socialist approach to um, economic policy making which had um, existed before and have pushed the economy more um, in the direction of uh, liberal economic um, policy making. Um, of course, um, that's just talking about um, the economic content. Um, important to note that um, there were uh, substantial adverse consequences um, uh, in Chile um, from um, the change um, in uh, government towards um, the military um, and, and major um, human rights um, abuses, abuses during the period leading up to when Chile again became um, a, to have a democratically elected parliament um, in um, 19. Um, 90. So if you're going to talk about um, overall well-being in Chile, obviously it would be important to factor both what I'm going to talk about in terms of the economics together with um, the human rights issues, especially during this um, first period of reform. But as I said, if we think about the economics, there were several um, stages of reform um, of the um, Chilean economy. In, in the first stage in the 1970s, uh, really a, a major opening up of the um, economy to um, international trade. Um, average tariffs in Chile were reduced um, from the early 1970s to the late 1970s from 75% um, to 20%. Uh, a lot of the um, distortions in the economy which um, were favouring uh, uh, industry under the ISI policy um, were um, removed. Uh, but Chile itself is a little bit of an example of um, but the disadvantages of partial reform in that end of the 1970s, early 1980s, um, Chile actually has uh, a, a, a pegged exchange rate as well, which leads to the type of external crisis that I described for uh, Mexico and Argentina. And so um, there's a small decline in GDP per capita in Chile in the early uh, 1980s. After that episode of external crisis in the early 1980s, 80s, the Chilean government engaged in further uh, economic reform. For example, uh, shifting off a peg currency, devaluing the Chilean uh, currency, uh, introducing uh, extra uh, labour market uh, flexibility, introducing an independent central bank, and, and trying to uh, increase the level of security of uh, property rights, 
uh, in particular to try and promote development of the uh, mining industry. In the 1990s, there's been a third stage of reform, uh, negotiation of free trade agreements with um, the European Union and the United States, um, privatisation of uh, state-owned uh, state enterprises. Associated with this extensive economic reform in Chile, as we saw on one of the first slides in the first section of this lecture, and as I'll show on the next slide here, there's a period of, of very rapid economic growth where Chile has really been the, the success story of, of Latin America. And, and to a large degree, that uh, has come from the Chilean economy becoming reoriented towards its areas of comparative advantage, fishing, agriculture, uh, mining um, as well. So for example, Chile becoming the world's um, second biggest uh, producer of fish, becoming major supplier to um, agricultural and, and on world um, mineral um, commodity uh, markets. Uh, partly that's to do with policy reform which has removed the incentives to be engaging in industrialisation. Partly I think it needs to be thought of as well as associated with uh, the policies of macroeconomic stabilisation uh, in in Chile. So uh, avoiding the sort of macroeconomic external and internal disruptions to economic activity that have characterised um, other economies in um, Latin um, uh, America. Um, and so there's been significant economic growth and reduction in the proportion of the population living in, in poverty. For example, um, from about 20% um, living in poverty in 1989 through to 5% um, um, in the early um, 2000s. This is a graph which compares um, GDP per capita in the Latin American 8, the red line of which Chile um, is a part from 1975 to 2010 against Chile. And so you can see that, so 1973 is about when the economic reforms start. You can see that um, there's a bit of an improvement associated that you might think of as being associated with those reforms. But then there's the setback of the external crisis in the early 1980s. But then since that time, really um, sustained and by comparison with the rest of Latin America, um, very rapid um, economic um, growth in uh, in Chile. Uh, so Chile has been a success story associated with economic reform. Uh, in other countries there's been, as you can see here and as we've described before, much lower rates of um, economic uh, uh, development. One way of thinking about that, as I've been describing on the, the, the slides um, preceding this graph, is to think of this is showing that um, economic reform didn't proceed far enough, that, that, that some elements of um, reform have been implemented but not all the elements of reform um, that you need um, to provide a basis for economic success or that you need to address uh, issues of uh, inequality in institutions uh, in order to provide a basis for um, successful policy making. Um, in the future. That's one approach to thinking. The, the other approach um, which um, has characterised the, the actual response of some Latin American countries has been a turn towards what's described as economic um, populism. Um, populism I guess we usually think of as, as individuals with strong, um, probably charismatic, charismatic personalities uh, who, who pitch the interests of the people against impersonal forces such as uh, uh, capitalism or um, overseas governments or foreign um, in investors. Um, and, and a turning towards economic populism has certainly been to differing degrees a response in some countries in Latin America to the, to the stagnation which has occurred in, in Latin America in the past um, 30 um, years. And, and where populism, economic populism has occurred in, in the past decade, for example, it's tended to um, emphasise economic growth and income distribution and, and downplay what have been the classical uh, problems of Latin America, rates of inflation, external um, constraints, and, and tried to push again towards a, a reduced role for uh, markets. Um, and so 
you know, Venezuela with um, che Hugo Chavez um, would be um, one e example. Um, economic populism, of course, and populism uh, has um, a long history in um, Latin um, America. Um, so this is really, in some ways, a, a re a re emergence. Uh, another example of populist type policies would be Argentina um, turning towards um, export taxes um, as a way of um, uh, regenerating revenue to finance um, uh, expenditure, social expenditure um, to benefit urban populations. So a, a, a turning away again from areas of comparative advantage to benefit the um, uh, groups within um, the um, population. So as we've seen in the first section of this lecture, Latin America's growth performance with the exception of um, uh, Chile amongst the large Latin American countries during the period from 1980 to, to 2010 has been poor compared to um, most other um, regions um, of the world. Latin America's history of reasonable economic growth in the periods before it means that it's still really in some ways at the top of the tree of the developed economies, even if it's still a long way, sorry, developing economies, top of the tree of the developing economies, even if it's still a long way um, from um, the developed um, economies. What will be uh, interesting in the future is the extent to which economic policies follow a populist line of uh, again turning um, away from um, areas of economic activity that Latin America might have um, a comparative advantage in, downplaying the role um, of um, the market, introducing a variety of um, government distortions into um, economic um, activity versus whether uh, there'll be an attempt to, uh, in the same way that's happened in Chile, implement um, reforms to institutions uh, and policies that provide uh, a more extensive liberalisation um, of economic activity and what the consequences of those different approaches will be for uh, economic um, development. I think the comparison between Latin America and Africa in Asia is going to be um, an extremely interesting one.